My name is Nayla Althani from the Education Development Institute in Pre-University Education. Before we begin with our keynote speaker in the session, please enjoy this musical piece by teachers from Qatar Music Academy.
Thank you to Qatar Music Academy for that beautiful piece. We hope you've enjoyed the music. We hope you've enjoyed the learning in previous sessions with accelerators and keynote speakers. We'd like to welcome our next keynote speaker, Kiran Sethi. Kiran Sethi is an Indian designer, educationalist, education reformer, and social entrepreneur. She founded the award-winning Riverside School in Ahmedabad that focuses on empowering children with the I can mindset, nourished with humane values. She founded Approach, an initiative to make our cities more child-friendly. And finally, Design for Change, which is today the largest movement of change for and by the children. Today, Design for Change has won multiple awards in more than 60 countries, and children use the simple design thinking framework of feel, imagine, do, and share to design solutions for some of the greatest challenges. Her most recent venture is the Riverside Learning Center, which offers training programs to empower schools across the world to become ICANN schools. Today's session is under the title, Human by Chance, Humane by Design. Student success requires, requires skills for collaboration, creativity, compassion, and problem solving. Design thinking is one of the ways this can, this can happen. It asserts that new and better things are possible and that each one of us can make change happen if we cultivate a human-centered, collaborative, and optimistic mindset. Please welcome on stage our keynote speaker, Kieran Sethi. Yes, namaste and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, we certainly know there's something wrong with the world when we start a greeting by saying, I hope you're all staying happily and positively negative. <laughs> Thank you so much to EDI for the invitation to share my work and for, your, for the opportunity to learn from all the wonderful talks this morning. And Kathy, I'm going to start where, having a clipboard wherever I go. <laughs> since I come from the land of Gandhi, and since we're focusing on service learning, I could not think of a more apt way and a message from him to start my talk. He says this, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. Suffice to say, the last two years we have lost more than we have found. And what a time we're going through. None of us could have predicted the scale and impact of COVID. We now know that a billion children have suffered the impact of school shutdowns. And we also know this will have a long lasting impact on their learning and well-being. There was some good news through all of this. Literally overnight, we witnessed unprecedented design innovations. Tech startups found the pandemic an opportunity to help bridge some of the gaping inequity that we uh, encountered in record time. We also cracked the formula for a vaccine so that the world could get back to a life as we know it. The not so good news, there is no getting back to anywhere. Just imagine the world our children have been witnessing over the last two years. For the first time, they are being told that to love somebody is to stay away from them. Be afraid, we are telling them. Be afraid of smiles, of schools, of you and of me. They say time heals all the wounds, but while our children might can recover physically, the question that begs to be asked is what vaccine will heal the damage this virus has caused to our children's hearts and minds? What will it take to build the immunity or to the viruses of fear, loneliness, and anxiety so that they can enjoy learning once again? What will it take to bring courage back? Ironical as it may sound, I was super grateful for 2020. Uh, never before had the world awakened to the power of empathy and emotional learning as the super fuel for education. Yes, while technology 
and learning apps have certainly given us the confidence that we can learn about things by ourselves. It has also highlighted that we can only learn about ourselves with each other. That is why I am so heartened that the theme of this conference is on focusing on the heart of our children so that the mind will follow. I'm also confident that schools will no longer be seen as institutions for passing tests and time, but as those last standing bastions of hope where children would learn about equity, service, joy, and purpose. For Riverside, we had been preparing for this for the last 20 years. Let me explain. 20 years ago, I was running my design firm and had no plans of changing the world. But life had other plans. And my whole world changed when I became a mother. It was when my son started school that I witnessed firsthand an education that rewarded compliance over conversation, control over curiosity an education that systematically removed voice from my sons um, and identity from him. So it got me thinking. In the first two years of any child's life on the planet, they share their superpowers with us. They go from crawling to sitting, walking, talking, and laughing, and telling us, look at me, I can. And then what do we do? We send them to school. Yeah, we asked them to sit and listen to us when they're six years of age. We solve their problems when they are 10. We tell them to only worry about themselves when they're 14. And when they are 18, we do them the greatest disservice when we tell them that their entire identity and success is measured by a single monodimensional metric, their academic scores. And then we are surprised why are children do not graduate as creative, empathetic, empowered citizens. So I took my son out of school that day. What was I to do next? As a mother, I reacted to what I knew was a crisis, a system that stripped my son of voice, empowerment, and purpose. But as a designer, I responded to the opportunity of this challenge. As Gandhiji said, you are whom you have been waiting for. So I set out to understand the education landscape, and this is what I encountered. Education the world over still struggles with this either or mindset. Either we have a one size fits all, content heavy, <coughs> test oriented <coughs> model where everybody tells you no, or we have a feel good, social emotional program where everybody is afraid to tell you no. But what if, what if education ensured that all children graduated with content and character, passion and compassion, doing good and doing well. Well, hope is not a strategy. So when I started the Riverside School in 2001, we had just one simple goal, to graduate young citizens who are aware of the world, enabled with the skills, and empowered to be the change and to design a more humane and compassionate world we call this the I can mindset. How are we doing this? Well, we use principles of design thinking to create a very simple four-step framework of empowerment and service learning. We call it FIDS for kids. Feel, imagine, do, and share. First start with feeling. We start with the heart. We invite children to observe and identify what bothers them in their immediate environment and what they wish to see changed. Then, imagine, children collaborate with friends and teachers and the community to brainstorm and design solutions for the change they wish to see. When then do, we ask them to implement the act of change. And then, my favorite word, share. We ask them to shamelessly share their stories of change so that they can inspire others to say, I can. The result of this, Every time a child experienced being the change, they were forever changed. I'm going to share with you uh, just three small sort of inspiring stories from Riverside. The first one is the story of my youngest children, six-year-olds, who saw the, the school handyman, Sunil Bhai, constantly running around trying to make you know, all the repairs. 
of the things. So they got together and decided to make his work a lot more stress-free and efficient. What you will see, of course, that they were doing problem solving and collaboration. But the biggest lesson they're teaching us, age has nothing to do with competency. This is their story. Four simple steps. Feel, imagine, do, and share. Just start by first feeling. What are you trying to solve? The problem was that um, Sunil Bhai, he likes to do a lot of work, but then he had to run back and forth. Sunil Bhai had to go everywhere, everywhere. Then we said, what do we do after we understand? We imagine a preferred scenario. There is the imagine. We hear each other's ideas so that we can come up with better solution. First of all, like, Earth had got the idea that we can make a belt. We were making a jacket. We talk, we will make lots of um, pockets. And then you go out and do the action. We illustrated first how the belt will look. We first cut the sleeves. We stitched, then we cut. Then we sticked only on three sides and so it became a pocket. And then you share it. I think one of the key things that we've learned is we were not sharing. We were just not sharing enough in education. We talked about with him that why we made this for him, how it will be use, useful for him. We were telling him he cannot waste his time and his energy. He was feeling happy because now he didn't have to run all over the place to find the keys. He just had to take it out from his pocket and give it to <laughs> the person who wants the key. To have our children have creative confidence is probably the greatest gift you can give them. <clears throat> well, they are the two most powerful words in the English language. I can. The second story is a story of my 13-year-olds who use the part of their FIDS framework to help the organization WASH United come up with games to help children understand the value of hygiene and sanitation. Of course, they're learning about the math and science of diarrhea and pollution. But what they're also telling us is that you cannot change somebody's life without it changing your own. This year, we got a challenge on diarrhea. We saw that it can be simply prevented by hand washing, but it was still killing billions of children across the world. And we wanted to know why. We thought of using the design thinking process to solve this problem. We went to different communities to observe children's hand washing behavior and their sanitation habits. What we found out was that the hand washing wasn't a priority for them. We had to imagine a way of making hand washing an important part of children's routine plus making a habit for ourselves. We were inspired by Wash United and their games on building awareness on sanitation. While we were creating the games, we got so involved in making them fun that we forgot that we had to have a message in them. The game was good but we could not understand and a little complicated. So finally we came up with three games. One was our own creation which is Dog and the Bone. In that, we learnt the resources we need while going to a washroom. The second one was a redesign of the wash game, which is bolded, in which we killed germs using soap. And the third one was a Bollywood dance, in which we learned the hand washing steps in a dance format. we became better by making sure that we wash our hands after and before a meal and we felt happy by seeing the children enjoying and learning through our games For all the parents who started worrying and saying, yeah, yeah, making children good human beings all very well, 
<laughs> what are butt marks? Well, our children show that their personal well-being has a direct impact on their academic scores. For the past 17 years, Riverside children have been outperforming the top 10 schools in India in your math, science, and English, proving that when children do good, they also do very well. The final story from Riverside is to demonstrate how FIDS is not only about serving the other, you know, external uh, change, but more importantly, it is service to self, internal change. As Gandhiji said, to find oneself, one must lose oneself in service of others. To help our children graduate with self-awareness, clarity of purpose, and to know the role they play in shaping a more humane world, for me, I think is the deepest impact of service learning. Towards this end, every graduating batch has one final moment of self-discovery and personal transformation before they set off to college. They go through a two-day immersion into the community. It's called INSANE. It's an acronym for inner sanitation. It's also insane because of the timing. We do it two weeks before their final exit examination. But it's a time for deep reflection, silence, meditation, and finding perspective of who they are and who they can become. This is insane. If every other experience has been more external, mm -hmm. I think this is going to be a very internal experience and an internal it's a light, uh, stage time. Yes, for us to for do us this. Yes. I think it's best to go in without any expectations, you know, go in on a clean slate. So they actually go rack picking with the community workers over that time. They see them, their stories, they meet their children, they help them in their community. It's all about that deep, visceral immersion. Margie's house uh, and we even took the Saturday special sessions and throughout the day I think the one thing that I have gauged and I have for now is respect. Each of you is going to be taking that word that you talked about yesterday. Respect. You're going to paint respect. You are going to take respect back with you to hang in your room and forever remind you that, that was your home. There is no direct implication or you know expression that de defines this painting, but in sense that it, at least to me it seems as if you know there's something and then there's some some understanding that you have of this world around you, and suddenly you are faced and hit by reality, and then it just explodes. So that's what this is about. Over the years, one of the goals at Riverside was not to become the best school in the world, but every day to strive to become the best school for the world. One of the most important lessons I've learned as a leader, you cannot lead from positional authority, not for your team, not for your parents, and most definitely not for your children. Our children must see the school as a center for service and the team committed to a purpose higher than success in academic scores. This gives one the moral authority to expect them to then engage with service learning. Riverside expects, actually Riverside demands that its community go beyond and blur the boundaries between school and life. A chance conversation from our 12-year-old children who shared that their parents were not comfortable sending their children outdoors to play anymore. I mean, I grew, grew up playing on the streets of my city, but that now is the reality. That became our I can moment. Um, this then led to the launch of Approach in 2007. What is Approach? This is our field. A society that loves its children will always build more parks than malls. It will have more community safe spaces and increased cycling paths. This is not the reality in most places. So we imagined, what is a city that cares for and designs for childhood? What will it look like? In 2007, we created Approach an initiative to make our cities more child-friendly. And we had simple activities such as parents of the park, reclaiming the parks for our children, for laughter and games, moving experience, 
A simple act of asking the city's multiplexes to open up their hearts and doors for the children from the streets so they could have popcorn and a wonderful memory. And the third, our most ambitious, street smart. We close down the busiest street for traffic and make it into a playground for children and childhood. Yeah? To accomplish this, the Riverside team had to work relentlessly with the traffic police to close down and reroute the traffic, the municipality for giving us the parks, the NGOs and schools to become partners in activities and games, and then also with the corporate houses to give us free volunteers. Here is a glimpse of how what happens when a city cares. And on August 15th this year, drum roll, we celebrated 15 years of approach. गरी में सी फिर ठंडा माहौल में जी फिर यहाँ बाजू पहुँचे यहाँ बाजू जब ये सीन माहौल देखा तो तभी दिल खुश हो गया I think this is very unique, absolutely first time in Ahmedabad where the city is giving so much space and time for the children. I've not seen um, an initiative which is so unusual and which is so caring about the city. <laughs> for service learning in Riverside, outside of Riverside, it was now time to take it to children all over the world. So in 2009, we launched Design for Change to take the I can believe to every child in the world. Today, over 2 million children in 63 countries are using FITS to design solutions for some of their greatest challenges. From reducing the weight of school bags to caring for the elderly, from, stop, uh, from tackling bullying to stopping child marriages, they are changing the bad and making good with the power of their ideas. I just want to show you two wonderful stories from the world. We've actually got 30,000 solutions from them. I'm going to show you two. And these are solutions of children who are telling us they don't have to be 18 years old, or you don't even need external resources. No money, no gadgets, no resources. And they're doing it now and unleashing it with the two powers they have within them, their heart, their mind, and the will to change. The first story is from uh, three-year-old children from the Nazareth School in Spain. After visiting a nearby park, they realized that the garbage bin was just too high for them. They could not reach it. Well, you'll have to see for yourself what they did, what solution they picked up, and told us that they're making change today.
second story and the last one I'm going to share is from a little humble village school in India. Witnessing that their grandparents were feeling neglected and disrespected, a nine-year-old superhero embarked on a deeply emotional story of capturing the wisdom of their elders, therefore offering a token of respect and gratitude. They then used those stories to make a little library in their school. This is service and love at work. The world is now waking up and taking notice. Today, the new superheroes are not Batman, Spider-Man, and, and uh, Superman, but 11-year-old Sakura from Taiwan and his friends who designed school bags that could become little helmets in case of earthquakes. Nine-year-old Anita from Bhutan who built a fence uh, with her friends so that her, her friends would not fall down the hill while going to school. And 13-year-old Juan from Colombia who helped preserve the Inca language in his village. We all know that COVID will not be the only crisis that the world will witness, but it has highlighted that the uncertain is the only thing that our children will encounter. And our children need new tools to not only navigate, but shape this uncertain world. So, Riverside is offering the FIDS formula as the I can vaccine. Our children need to build the antibodies of empathy, courage, service, and passion as they unleash their agency for greater good. Before I bid you farewell, allow me to provide some context to the moment in history. We are here today, and so many of our loved ones are not. Our rooms will be quieter, and our hearts will be heavier. Never before have the words today and now played such a significance in the choices we make, and our children are watching us. Will we choose to turn this crisis into an opportunity, or continue to advocate for a system that we know now is broken? that only values children being markable and not remarkable. As I shared, Riverside was preparing for this for the last 20 years. Why is this I can message so important for our children, especially in such times? It encourages them to believe that the tiny corner of the planet they inhabit can be made more beautiful, more just, and more equal. More importantly, it teaches them that they do not need to be mere spectators to change. They can be the initiators, the participants, and the overseers of it. The one lesson I have learned, graduating humane citizens with an ICANN mindset does not happen by chance, it happens by design. So what are we waiting for? Unfortunately, most ministers of education today are so consumed with science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and having higher test scores, that they forget that at the end of the day, if we don't have people of good character, people who do the right thing, intellect in itself will destroy the world. It will not save it. The world has a lot to learn from what's happening here at Riverside School.
Ta da! <laughs> And, and FYI, my son now teaches at the school. <laughs> so it's full circle. Thank you. Oh, I love that. Um, I'm going to keep framing it with my education in design, right? And when we keep saying human-centered design, our children have often been incidental to the entire journey of design, right? So I think for me, when I started Riverside, my oldest was six-year-olds. So then I kind of grew it a year at a time. But even then, they had a voice in the room. They were at the table. So the word co-creation is a very powerful word. Not in a notional patriotic, I mean patronizing way to say, oh, okay, that's so cute. But this is in a serious way to listen and trust that voice. I'll give you a small example, even the name of my school. I remember when I was starting, I thought I'll have this heavy, big name that talks about education. And, I, and, and in India, we have this the very first by the university was, was built in India. It was called Takshashila. Big, profound name. And my six-year-olds, I remember we were creating the whole school, and I said, tell, what about the name? Why don't you say I'm going to school in Takshashila? So they said, we are going to Takshapila. <laughs> so if a child cannot even say the name of the school, one, it's a moment to pause. So we gave up the options. My, my school is on the banks of the river Sabarmati, where Gandhi started his Dandi March. So it has a lot of symbolic meaning. And so Riverside came so easily to that. That's just one of the ways, one of the moments I'm seeing. But everything, right, from what does time look like? What does learning look like? What, does, what do you want to be valued for? So like Kathy was mentioning about that um, personal inventory, right? We, the kids created something called the identity curriculum, simply because when they reached uh, 13, a lot of children in India, I don't know whether it's true across the world, but commit suicide when they don't get the right marks. Now, how desperate should a child feel that the only way out is to commit suicide? That prompted the entire design of the identity curriculum to understand that they have self-worth. So all of this is done because of co-creation, inviting the child in, having that conversation, and genuinely prototyping the way out. So that really is, I would encourage, listen and not instruct. Uh, that's the one superpower I have learned over the years. <laughs> Quietly and under the radar for the first five years. <laughs> I have to say, I started the school in my home, right? I didn't have um, any other place. I was just so uh, kind of clear that there has to be another way. I didn't know it would be a better way. I just that there has to be something else. My son can't be feeling this. So when I started at home in my home, I remember the the whole thing. I mean, India needs schools, right? I mean, we've got 300 million children that go to school in India. That's the entire population of the United States of America. So I think the need for having children have a schooling experience is important. And in India, if you're not taking the state board or uh, any money from the government, you just need a not, uh, no objection certificate, and pretty much you can start. And then, of course, you have to eventually graduate into getting the board that you will affiliate yourself with. So you were quiet, and we went under. And as we knew more and did more, we started sharing more. So the first seven years was just learning. I didn't come from education, so it was very liberating, but it also was a massively huge learning curve. And then, of course, today, 
Riverside is now influencing the language of education in India and across the world and is creating those uh, opportunities to see what can be and not what is. Come, come visit me. Have coffee with Kiran. <laughs> Oh, good one. Um, parent partnership. How do you convince them? I, I say this humbly and with this thing that you have to be shameless. Um, so I think in my case, um, you know, the evidence of children's agency was so evident when we started. I remember the first six months. Oh my God, why are you not teaching nursery rhymes? The other school is teaching 12, why are you not doing it? The pushback was big, you know, because that's what we are used to. And I kept telling them, you have choice, I don't. I didn't know then what I would like to do, but I knew very clearly what I was not gonna do. Right, that clarity I had. So I kept telling the parents, I said, listen, I was very lucky not to have a financial uh, sort of, um, you know, I had to be uh, break even at a certain time, etc. So there was a lot of, lot of luck that was flowing my way. So I used that. I used, I used that to my advantage and said, I'm not changing it. The school is built on uncomfortable questions, but if you want to go, you have choice. So I think over time they started seeing their children because they saw the dramatic difference between a report card that that other children were getting by saying 78% in English and 90% in math. And the fact that that child would not be able to even run a five minute conversation, let, I mean, would not be able to compute well. And then they started seeing the children at Riverside being able to hold their own and be, you know, sort of present like you've seen uh, in the vi videos. So I think today they come for that, but I didn't care. I was just so, I was just so clear that I, I would want that child to be part of it. So and a lot of parents didn't like me very much first, but. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know what the hell was happening. But I think they somewhat found that in their children. And they, today, with great pride, they say, oh, we can see a Riverside student. And a lot of sense of humor. You have to keep ha having the humor in it. Yes. <laughs> teach. Um, yeah. Um, the first question about exams, we sit for exams only from year eight or grade eight, or 13 year olds. Before that, I've understood one real truth that till you're 13, you're still understanding and building a habit of mind. And I've seen too many children who used to come to my school when they were young. You know, when they write, they would put their hand in front and, sh and hide. And that's a terrible thing to promote, right? This little thing, oh, I will not share. And this idea of abundance comes from being able to share. Um, so we build that in, in their, when they're 13, they sit for their first sort of uh, exam, and then they sit for the, we, we take the CIE board, the Cambridge International Education, right? So they finally sit for their O levels and A levels. But that's just so much later in, in, in their journey as they're growing. But we take what is called a national benchmarking test. It's a, it's a skill-based evaluation, not content, but it's skills. That means that it can work across any board. That's really where we see the evidence of the fact that they're learning the skills in everything they do. So a question that actually I know uh, Evan had asked for the fact of what is service learning outside of the curriculum. And for me, every session is an opportunity for service learning. The moment we put them separately, say once a week you'll do this, then you've you have not given the same value as you do with math. Why is math got five days a week? Why is English got five days a week? Why isn't character building five days a week? Right? So I think in the terms of the value of how we insist that everything comes, whether I'm learning a mathematical concept, the higher purpose of learning is not for a test. So we've crafted what we call our year at a glance, which offers us a, a guiding principle or a lighthouse that even mathematical computation 
is a way to serve an idea, right? So if that narrative is again and again brought to our children's notice and focus that you're learning for, for whether you call it service or empowerment, it has to start with empathy and it has to start with purpose. So we do definitely teach phonics and you know, your, your, your quadratic equations, but uh, it is part of the larger purpose of our vision at Riverside is that we will become humane. And the five E's that make us humane are empathy, ethics, excellence, elevation, and evolution. It's the five values that shape all the decisions we make. For the first one, we have seen that uh, of late there is less movement, but we've seen that when there has to be, because we have a lot of government officials who have their children with us, and then they travel from state to state. And in t I've had principals from different schools calling me up, Uta, who are you? Where is Riverside? What are you teaching these children? <laughs> you know? Because they, I think, are charmed by the confidence and the way they are able to do the skill set. So that's the, that's the easy part. The second in terms of the, the kind of um, um, curricular opportunities that we design, some are based on what we've codified over the years to know that this works. I'll give a small example. When the first time we did uh, deep citizenship teaching, I got a textbook uh, of children's rights. I was part of a workshop and beautiful uh, real reports, newspaper reports of children's rights being violated. And, it was very emotional, and I got it into my class, and I said, okay, let's read this. And there was all the clucking and the clicking and saying, yeah, 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 very bad, very bad. Okay, intellectually, they were all getting it. And I said, boss, it's not working. This is not happening. And so then we created uh, a very immersive experience for the children, literally mimicking a sweatshop, where they're rolling these agarbati sticks, these incense sticks, for three days. And I remember telling them, oh, come tomorrow, we have a surprise. And they thought, oh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And I get them in the morning. It's cold. Uh, and, uh, no sweaters outside. You have to sit on your haunches in a tiny little blackened room. And you're rolling these, uh, this thing. I kid you not. It started by saying, oh, we can do it. It's so cool. And in half an hour, when the body and the shoulders started paining and they had to move, I kept asking them, you can leave any time you want. You can leave this. You have choice. You can go home and crip to your mom and say, oh, they made me so sad, and I'm just saying, those children just don't have that. So, up to you. Not a single child left. They all did it. They, that moment kind of just drove them to go into the, do a street play and work with an organization working to save children from child labor. So we realized that that, that experience was so incredibly immersive and moving that that became an annual for every year that comes there. So some become your kind of milestones, and some happen because of, of, of moments in life. I remember when the tsunami hit in 2004, we stopped everything, because India was deeply kind of uh, uh, impacted by that, and that became. I still remember a school coming and saying, what are your children doing a unit on the earth and moving? Oh, ours is scheduled for August. You know, so can, you, can your, can your timetabling be nimble and agile enough to bring in what is relevant, what is, what, is, what is important at that moment? So sometimes I find that that's the struggle schools have. No, 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 our curriculum is fit and we can't move it and we can't change it. So we do a, a bit of both. <laughs> I will give you the biggest pain that happened. Okay. okay. 2001. Yeah, I, I heard it. Thank you. So it's 2001. I'm inspired to start a school. And uh, on the 18th of January, I put the ad, the first and only ad in the papers. Oh, I'm starting a school. Now, maybe 15 phone calls. Somebody who knew me, maybe, maybe, this is okay. I said, 
I have a building, okay, I'm gonna show it to you, please come. So on the 26th of Jan, 8.45 in the morning, I'm going to meet these parents in the school and the biggest earthquake that hit, hit that day. 8.45, a 7.9 literally shook the entire earth. The building got damaged, the parents left, the, the teacher was gonna start the school with me, left not India, I mean, left not the school, but India. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, in hindsight, you know, if you can manage an earthquake, everything else, piece of cake. Parents complaining, hey, seven pointer. <laughs> so obviously there are gonna be earthquakes around the way. We've had so many and it never gets easier, I've realized. You know, I remember that after five years, I was thinking, my God, we're doing such great work. Why aren't parents loving us? They're not, they're, their responsibility is not to love us. Our responsibility is just do the work. It is not because of their love that we're doing it, it's because we want to make meaningful education. So over time, every, every uh, uh, yardstick that you know, middle years and then the senior years and then we got our first results, every milestone had its own deep pain. <laughs> but I think what I've learned as a leader is it's not the talent or the skill you need, but it's the stamina. Oh, stamina is what you need to go through all of it. Stamina, being shameless, and having a sense of humor will take you through anything. Thank you. Uh, for Qatar. Yes. So I know we got recently into the movement. In family, yes. There are about 15 schools, at least 15 schools in the room and much more online. Can you tell us what it means for us to have, oh. to be part of this? Thank you. You're part of the haloed group. No, no, I'm just kidding. No, I cannot thank you enough. Um, we have seen that this framework, Feel, Imagine, Do, Share, is such a contextual framework. It is not teaching you content. It is not heavy duty books that you have to go through. It's context. And that's, I think, one of the reasons it became universal and so easy to put into any existing curriculum. So for us, our interest is to, to kind of understand what do our children of Qatar, are, what are they worried about? What is it that bothers them? And for me to have the schools in, um, in Qatar being part of the movement means many things. One is, I remember when I did Design for Change for the first year, we reached 30,000 schools in India. My first story came to me from a little corner state in India which nobody hears of. Mizoram, okay, Nagaland. And we started crying. We looked at that story, so my God, there are children in Nagaland who are making the world a better place. Then that little story from the village. Suddenly, these children were being spotlighted. They were merging into the light. And how can you then deny the obvious understanding that children are capable, right? You can't now, it's in your face. So today when I'm taking and I've become, my greatest I think joy is to be a storyteller on their behalf, taking the stories across the world. I wanna share stories from Qatar to the world. I wanna let them know that this is what our children are bothered with, this is what they're able to do. Age, gender and demographics are filters we just have to remove from our eyes and our mind. So I think for me that is important. Of course, being part of the DFC family means many other things. We have our global celebration every year. This year it's in Malaysia and Uruguay. Next year, ladies and gentlemen, it's in India. You have to come. Okay, so all the countries will come to India. We'll have the children there sharing. It's celebratory. It is the ability to use that same framework for pedagogical shift. So I would just say that I think the greatest thing is they came out of the dark and into the light. I've seen too many, I'm sorry, but international schools will say, but we're too busy and we're anyway doing it. Great, but show me. Give it to me, be shameless, because if you're doing it, it's hidden away in your, in your walls, how do I show that and inspire some children across the world? So I think for me, it's really that. Um, and, I, and I'll tell you one thing, four or five years ago, we did a global analysis about what was bothering our children the most. Guess what came out? Bullying, 
across the world. If our children are scared, they're not learning. But we're not hearing. And where were they getting scared most? In the bathrooms of schools? Because architecturally, the bathrooms are always tucked away in the corners where there's no light. Corridors of schools, playground, and now social media. So if my child is scared and coming to school and I'm getting a a terrific activity, but I'm scared because I know that person sitting on the same table with me. How am I going to learn? Some real insights came out, and they, how do you make our uh, places safer and more uh, conscious? So I think it gives us data from our children across the world that this is what our children are telling us. They're wanting teachers. By the way, do you know what they want the most from teachers? Take a wild guess. Not competency. That they're getting from Khan Academy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Yes, they want to walk out of that room with you. But what do we do? We walk out of the room, rush into a staff room, close the door. They're saying, sit with me on the corridor, check in with me. When you tell me how you're feeling tomorrow, the next day, don't forget me. That's what they remember their more. That's what they're wanting from our teachers, that deep interest and attention to me. And I noticed, I saw what happened to my son, one of 60 children in a class. I remember going to his teacher three months later and saying, tell me about my son, tell me what he loves doing, who his friends are. And she looked at me and said, what is his role number? That's it, he didn't even have a name. Right, so here you all are blessed. You'll have small schools, you have fantastic facilities. There's just so much going for you, there's so much. I think you can, it's just gonna be super exciting to see it inspire the world. Okay, last question. Then we go for tea. <laughs> yeah. So, oh. Because it sounds like you've roped your son in, which is wonderful, but I'm curious how you deploy all that social capital that yeah. is raised across your school environment. We have pushed them. I have got 10 batches that have graduated so far, and it is the most delightful narrative that we've got, because we've, we've been following them up, right? Every time they go, they have to, in one month, send us a mail to say how they're fitting in, are we serving them well, et cetera, et cetera. The stories are remarkable. But just recently, Harvard's Good Project did a longitudinal study about the promise of Riverside over two years. They took the same batch and they kind of tracked them over two years. It is crazy. I mean, I'm gonna share the data with you, but the main thing they're talking about is community, service, uh, leadership, empowerment, all of these that they ha have got from the school to make them more competent. So personal confidence, personal growth, the ability to reflect self-efficacy, all of these are the outcome, which is what we actually wanted. But I can tell you about it, but the data is also now validating that moment. But I'll tell you a couple of stories. I remember one of my boys went to this really kick-ass uh, engineering college, okay? And then he writes me back, he said, you know, okay, ma'am, uh, I was sitting for, for, for my, at the canteen, and they all laughed at me when I said thank you to the canteen boy, and I picked up my plate. You know, that little moment reflects so much. He says, today, they all are picking up and helping Mahesh. Another girl, she said, okay, ma'am, I can say no. And I said, oh my God, thank you. You know, the ability to say no and not succumb to peer pressure and have all of those, those attention on her, what a marvelous gift that you can give the child to say, okay, I can say no, not a problem. So I think we're collecting. In fact, if you get onto our website, we have the alumni link. We've captured their emails and made them into books. Little story books you can download. Exact emails that they've written to us, just compiling it to tell anybody who says, you know, if this is what we want. So we track them and we hound them. And I keep telling my children, I said, if you get married and not give me a destination wedding, no, I'm not coming to you. <laughs> now I can live through all my alumni. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just wanted to wrap up on a few points. Obviously, I'd like to thank Karen and the other keynotes, as well as the accelerators and everybody who contributed on the stage. I'd also, though, like to thank all the people, although I won't name them because I will leave some out and they don't want to be recognized anyway. You know who you are. 
Um, but all the people behind the scenes who spent so much time and effort making sure that things went as smoothly as they could. Because educators, we know that not everything goes smoothly. So I want to thank you, the people who stayed with us to the end. In fact, you, the participants, are the one who brings really the third dimension to these activities. You're the one who brings the dimension, the context, and the questions that make these types of uh, events come to light. And so I want to thank you as well for being here. And I just want to close by saying, as educators, as I said before, we know it's never perfect and we could get better. And so Evan wanted me to remind you that an email has already been sent out with a survey feedback. Please take the time to give us your feedback about how you think this event could be better in the future and perhaps how you might contribute to it as well. But thank you all for coming. And thank you to all the organization, organizers and participants. Have a very nice evening.